Morning, Mr. Superbacker. Nice to have you back with us. It's Thursday, March 28th, 2024. The coffee is tasting especially delicious here this morning here on the stock desk. What does it mean to never give up? Uh, it means that if you have to work night shift and you're up until 2 o'clock in the morning as the working man doing the best that he can, you still get up to do the morning show regardless. All right? It's nice to have you with us. The late morning Brody, Brody show. Hot dice in the stream here this morning. Why do cowboys wear ho Why do cowboys ride horses? Because they're too heavy to carry. And how did the cowboy set his chaps on fire? Well, he was riding on a range. And if you're wearing a cowboy hat are you ranch dressing who knows it's nice to have you with us here this morning the late Brody morning show that's right i gotta ask yourself the question do you like tracking the prices of magic cards is there enough information out there or is there too much gall darn information let me do it for you i'm doing it weekdays monday through friday here on the morning show catching me a little later here this morning I had a late Late, late work day yesterday. Started at 4.30 a.m., got up, went for a run, did a little breakfast. Then I got up, did the morning show, went into work, had a full shift, then did a back-to-back -back shift. Didn't finish up till about 1.30 in the morning last night. It was about a 21-hour shift. So Brody's the working man, doing the best that he can for the working man to put cardboard on the table. And if you're able to make it here on the morning show during the weekdays, wherever you've got Brody dragging along for the ride, I want to give you a big shout out and much appreciation for your continued support for sticking with me all this time. Wherever you got me dragging along for the ride here this morning, maybe you got me hanging from the rear view mirror of the car, perhaps you've got me on the bumper or duct tape to the bottom of the snow shovel, maybe hanging around the water cooler this morning discussing the new spoiler from Outlaws of Thunder Junction and the magic cards that have been the talk of the town this week. Wherever you got me dragging along for the ride, it's going to be a good show today. We've got no time limit, so I get to go a little bit longer. And, and this also, see, every cloud has a silver lining. So despite yesterday being a long, long and intense day, I thought, you know what, the positive side to that is that every cloud has a silver lining. I get to get up and do the morning show. I might catch a few viewers that I don't normally catch, and I can sit back and relax and bring you folks uh, an amazing stream here this morning with no pressure to get out the door, no time limit. All right? <laughs> ding, ding, ding. 12 rounds of Brody Alfonso here this morning. Feeling good, frisky, and footloose and fancy free. Telling cowboy puns because, well, that's what the new set is all about. It's a Western theme of Outlaws of Thunder Junction. And what did the cowboy tell everybody at his second rodeo? This isn't my first rodeo. That's right. This ain't my first rodeo, folks. We're happy to be here, and we're ready to do this. Let's take a look and warm up the chops here this morning with a couple of AI-generated magic cards. You know how it works here this morning, but I'll go over the rules again in a minute here for you folks. Uh, we're going to look at some AI-generated magic cards here this morning over at Robo Rosewater. We'll rate them. How great are they? Well, we'll have to rate them and find out. But if the card is playable any way whatsoever, even if it's a little bit over-costed, you'll hear this sound. The sound of the dinger, right? And if the card is non-functional, if it's got junk text on it, if it doesn't work, if it's not a magic card, if it's missing some of the key elements of a Magic the Gathering card, you'll hear this sound. The buzzing. You might even hear this sound. Today's Tom Sawyer. And what do you say about his company? is what you say about society. Time for some magic talking while I'm swinging the hammer, baby. All right, put another nail in that coffin. Let's take a look at some of these magic cards here this morning. Over on the stock desk, let's get rolling here this morning. Wow, 
What do we got going on here? A little technical difficulty. We'll fix this up for you folks here this morning. Have no fear. Brody's here quite easily fixed up this morning. Let's go with this one. Push a couple buttons here this morning. Boom, boom. And there we go. Here we got the AI generated magic cards here this morning. What do we got? Winds of Judge. Let's judge this card. No judgment here. All are welcome here on the stream. We got a interesting vehicle here this morning. Vehicles. This one. What is it going to do for us? It's going to cost us three mana. Three mana banana. This one here. Let's see here. Ah, we're lagging. That's better. All right, we're live and direct here this morning. Everything's all fixed up. Technical difficulties behind us. Infinibrody here this morning. Winds of Judge. This one's a three mana artifact creature vehicle. And I, I'm not so sure. Can anybody help a bro out here this morning? The mounts. The mounts in the new set. It reminds me of like the terminology from world of warcraft where you get mounts and you get to ride them are these mounts mountable can you put a creature on them can you send them around the battlefield and do some interesting stuff well this one here is a vehicle the first type of mount i guess in the game of magic the gathering three mana for a three three and it cruise for two whenever winds of judge deals combat damage to a player its controller creates a token that's a copy of winds of judge Ooh, spicy very fiery very spicy very fiery and spicy and nice here this morning all right let's pass it it seems fine fair fair card fairest fairest all of them all the experimental demolisher let's experiment with some ai generated magic cards here this morning and what do you call a cowboy that teaches singing and acting that's a stage coach doing some cowboy puns here this morning as an experiment on the stream this experimental demolisher is going to cost you two red a green a white and then one black and one for a 6-6 six, six, creature beast with constellation. Whenever an experimental demolisher or another enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, choose one. You may exile the top three cards of your library. Until the end of your next turn, you may play those cards or put two plus one plus one counters on target creature you control if you do draw a card. That seems fine. Six mana for beast. Could have some more creature type on it. Maybe some better tribal for this one. Let's rate it. How rate is this one? This seems fair. Just a fair, fair magic card. And oh, this pop has got my heartstrings. All right. And how, what, did, what happened? What kind of a job did the cowboy get at the bank? He got a new finance job at the bank. Now he's a lone ranger, right? Here's your lone ranger joining you this morning on the stream. The body shore. This one's a 4-2. It's a white creature. It costs you two white and three for the doggy dog world. It's a doggy dog world out there. As Body Shore enters the battlefield, choose a player. When Body Shore enters the battlefield, if it was Bless, each opponent chooses loses two life and you gain five life. I don't know what Bless is. It's a it's a it's a non -fa. it's so cute though. I don't want to pass it. Because we don't know what Bless is. If it was Bless, all right, non-functional keyword. Put an R there. It says Brody. Ah, Brody Shore, right? Nice to have you with us, Michael Superbacker. Coffee's tasting exceptionally well this morning here. Fair under power OP, non-functional. This one doesn't function because we don't know what the blessed mechanic is. Zyroth, the Manomora Blade. Mm. That's a mouthful. And this is a mouthful of coffee. All right. Cowboy still has terrible nightmares about the worst job he ever had, where he was making records in a music factory. How depressing is that? And a cowboy got a new dash hound because the other cowboys told him to get along, little doggy. So let's get along with this little doggy here. A green and one for this artifact gate. Creatures you control have cumulative upkeep, pay one life. Ooh, stinky poo poo. This one's got a bit of a downside on it. And threshold, as long as seven or more cards are in your graveyard, Zyroth, the mana are more, this one's a mouthful. 
Mona Morobade gets plus three plus three and has base power and toughness five times and greens trample for two mana. And it gives itself this upkeep cost and your other creatures. I guess if you get a two mana five five, this is what you get. It seems fine. I think this seems fine. Underpowered. You don't say. And what else we got here? Mystic Ward. I think this is where we left off yesterday. You can prevent all damage that would be dealt to creatures you control for one white. At instant speed, it's like a fog type effect. This one here seems just fine, but it's passive. All right. Good morning, folks and fans, and those who like to crack open packs and shuffle up stacks of Magic the Gathering cards. It's really not that hard. If you get up with me and join me on the morning show, a bit of a late run here today. But as I described earlier, I'm feeling good and I'm happy to be here and I'm ready to bring you guys some interesting Magic the Gathering news articles starting out. Let's head on over to the stock desk because there's an interesting card over card article over there by Corey Williams. Howdy, bro. Morgan, Damas and Heron, Von Ohad, Netherlands. This is your Ambevol and Dachelix Magic the Gathering stream. People joining us from all over the world, including the Netherlands. Nice to see you. Huya Morgan, Mr. Arjun. Great to have you with us here this morning. Woo, let's go. All right, I got an awesome article. And now Corey Williams is a man with impeccable writing taste. I love to give these writers a voice. If you could hear them, this, if you could hear the voice inside my head, reading these Magic the Gathering articles and spreading the news and what's moving and shaking some thoughts and opinions and some early morning bacon, this is a thought piece from Corey Williams, somebody who makes great. Magic the Gathering articles, I always love to read the work by Corey Williams and the folks over at the stock desk bringing us something to think about here this morning. Let's take a look at this. If, mod if follow cards were legal in modern, oh, if only. Modern is a little hungover at the moment. Recent bannings of the violent outbursts and living end is in a state of relative despair and Teamer Rhinos is surprisingly nowhere to be found while Gorio's Vengeance Reanimator and Indomitable Creativity builds popping up left and right, as the modern metagame sorts itself out. Of course, Yawgmoth, Amulet, Titan, Merc, Tide, Tron players are happy to move forward like nothing of consequences have occurred. Tron players are washing their hands with the recent bannings because they don't care. So with this in mind, I figured we might as well shut a little bit of lighthearted article on the spirit of the hypotheticals and wish that we will likely never come true. But however, today we're discussing the top five cards from Universes Beyond Fallout that I wish were modern legal and that they would be fit in to a deck. Spoiler, spoiler, they don't, at least not in the top end of the metagame, but their hypothetical potential for lower tier builds certainly warrants wishful thinking at the heart of this article. So Corey Williams bringing us something to masticate on and think about here this morning. This could be a good one. Inventory management, here's a card. Let's just take a look at it because we wanna, wanna see, what's this one, split second. Split second seeing a comeback here in the game of Magic the Gathering. It was quite an interesting mechanic when it was first printed because it was a type of mechanic that you couldn't interact with while it was on the stack. Very, very good, good mechanic. to be printed on a Magic card at instant speed. You can't react to it. And what does this one do? For each aura and enchantment creature or equipment you control, you may attach it to a creature you control. So this one would be slotting into a Hammer Time deck. It's sort of the first thing that... I would sort of think of this, any of the equipment builds, hammer time. Well, let's talk about it here with Corey Williams. Two words, split second. There's two words not more compelling in Magic the Gathering than these two, aside from Black Lotus and Ancestral Recall and Time Walk and the Moxes. Okay, no will digress just a little bit, but split second is a wonderful mechanic that's used very sparing in its applications, although when it's utilized in card design, it produces some absolutely terrific cards. Like the most recent Legolas Quick Reflexes Borderless, for example, inventory management for the same mana cost as Lightning Helix allows you to play at instant speed, instantaneously move all your auras and equipments and permanents from any number of creatures to any number of other creatures on the battlefield. You can do one big swap and go Voltron model for more of everything onto just one creature. Just move it all in one shot. This card would be awesome in modern. I think he's right here. The potential for this card is sky high in Commander, so it would fit into a modern deck, wouldn't it? Well, 
if boggles were still a thing, this card would have a place in some version of the build. More realistically, however, this card feels like super good in Hammer Time archetypes where one can use inventory management at instant speed to cheat the Colossus Hammer and any other equipment cards that you may have into play onto your desired creature. While simultaneously limiting your opponent's ability to respond, the financially speaking about this card is that one or more in-demand cards in Fallout. It's very in-demand for people who are moving equipment around. If So if you're inclined to get your hands on a couple of these for speculation's sake or just plain old fun, this card buy, buy, buy. is a buy. It's a buy, buy, buy. I'd pick this sucker up because it's got legs. This card has so many legs and it knows how to use them. I think they wrote a song about it. He's got legs and knows how to move them equipment onto your creatures all right it's surge foil runs for around 24 dollars today is the market price so if you're inclined to get your hands on a couple of these speculations just for plain fun it'll cost you around two whole dollars not too shabby for this effect and it's potent chef kiss good abilities that can handle all your artifacting equipments at instant speed and move them around on the battlefield to give your creature a boost all right what do we got here not to be confused McCready, the Lamplight Mayor. Let's take an extra look at this card, this Orzov card. It costs you one black and a white for this one three human advisor. Let me give you some mm, let me give you some advice here this morning. Pick I think I'll pick up a copy of that one. Thanks. Thanks, folks. McCready, the Lamplight Mayor. I love to see the chat flying by here this morning. It's so great to have you folks with me here. Let's discuss this article from Corey Williams and dig a little deeper on some of these follow cards that maybe could be, should be. Modern legal. What would happen? Whatever creature you control with power two or less attacks, it gains skill until in a turn, which means it can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. Whenever a creature with power four or greater attacks you, its controller loses two life and you gain two life. So it's got the drain ability built right in on it. McCready, the Lamplight Mayor, is an Orzov creature, a 1 3 human advisor, and is advising us of its potential for modern here this morning. Now that's Corey Williams giving us some advice. Some something to think about. Not to be confused with the McCready from John Carpenter's Thing in 1982, although perhaps we'll get a universe beyond of John Carpenter's filmography in the future with some iconography and Kurt Russell as uh, R.J. McCready. But Jamie Lee Curtis <laughs> as a uh, Laurie Strode and Sam McNeil as a John Trent and James Hong as the evil sorcerer for low pain in the card form. I definitely let loose there, but I apologize sincerely for the using of this article as an excuse to recite my love for John Carpenter's film. Back in magic. Back to magic. All right. McCready is a fascinating little guy who makes you, your small creatures, less blockable and by bigger creatures and the skulk mechanic at use. Beyond this, it punishes your opponent for attacking with a big creature and compensates you with life gain too. Okay, or hear me out. You build Abzan Infect. Not a deck as far as I know, but so that you can swing with your measly low-powered, low-to-the-ground Glistener Elf and pump before damage to capitulate on the Skulk. Capitalizing on the Skulk ability and creatures not being able to block it. Is this a good strategy? No. Is Infect playable? No. Is this a problem in my eyes? Yes, perhaps, but perhaps I'm too nostalgic. But the lack of infect in the metagame, aside from Hammer Time, wherein the effect is more an incidental means to speed up the clock rather than the primary goal, it really does bum me out. Perhaps McCready, in all his glory, can make a small creature great again, including the oft-forgotten Abzan token decks of old, maybe the Siege Rhino, perhaps. And the best part of this hidden gem is it's well under 50 cents for a copy of a base power pre-con version. This card... Cheap to get it in your collection, does amazing things, it's powerful, and it's only a couple of pennies. If you want to pick it up, it could be played in Commander, not in Modern, but let's imagine that it could. Next up, we got this card. Silith Synth Ilf Infiltrator. Infiltrating our stream here this morning by way of the stock test. This is a 0-0. Zero, zero. I think this one is a clone card, is it not? Let's read it. It's 2 blue and 3 for a 0-0 zero, zero artifact synth, and it says investigate because your artifacts can help you cast this spell, and each artifact you tap pays for one in addition of its mana cost. So when you enter the battlefield, it enters as a copy. Very important text on that. It comes into the battlefield as a copy. It doesn't enter and then become a copy. As a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except as an artifact creature in addition to its other types. If I'm being honest, I have no clue how to break this card, but hypothetically, of course, having said that artifact synergies in modern, like Urza's Thopter Sword, and are at an all-time low in representation of the decks like Hardened Scales and Tron, acting as the forefront of even 
uh, playing non-equipment artifacts in the format. So having said that, I'm a sucker to improvise mechanic. I've loved it ever since playing the War of Invention and Clark Clan Eggs so many moons ago. Impro improvise is more or less just an artifact convoke, which means in theory it's possible for Synth Infiltrator to enter the play as early as turn two for cheap to blue mana. If you want a cheap clone, if you're playing Commander CEDH that plays a lot of mana rocks, maybe you've got treasure tokens on the battlefield, they can improvise this out. This card, bye, bye, definitely bye. a buy, buy, buy. Bye, bye, bye. Just a couple of cents for this card. 49 cents. Now, all of this is great, but there's a better two-mana clone in Legal and Modern. I think that's the Phantasmal Image. And in that, they cost two mana without any drawbacks. Specifically, Phantasmal Image, which is on its own, it doesn't see a lot of play, but much play. I mean, no play. I play Phantasmal Image in Commander simply because I don't have a copy of the Orcish Bowmasters, and I'm not really to pony up the Doe Masters for the Bowmasters because I don't want to pay the 50 bucks for a card that just came into print. I'll play the Phantasmal Image for a couple of bucks less, and it enters the battlefield. It kills your opponent's Bowmasters by dealing one damage to it, and then you get the Bowmasters. But nevertheless, I digress. What makes Sith Infiltrator more interesting is the fact that this card type includes the word artifact in it, which means you can get target it in your grave with Emery Lurker in the Locks activated ability. You can cast it from your graveyard for Emery enabling you to cast it with the Improvise once more, and you could copy Emery and mill four more cards in advance, whatever game-ending combo you're trying to aim for, and accelerate the likely underworld breach that is ensuing in hardened scales or affinity this card is fits right in there with a home for many easy ways to improvise it into play with many terrific tactics and targets to copy beyond modern synth infiltrator can also be tinkered for making it one of the most accessible clones of all time in the right deck <laughs> deck the dedicated build is what the downfall of this card, well, it competes for space in decks that could also run Phyrexian Metamorph, which is only costing you a single blue and three. And it also is payable by Phyrexian Mana, which is at its cheapest cost, about three generic mana and two life, making it usable in decks outside of blue apart from the color pie. Metamorph can also attach, uh, can also copy artifacts or creatures like your opponent's one ring, making it much more versatile and more desirable because you get to copy your opponent's shenanigans. And despite costing slightly more in practice than the Synth Infiltrator, this Synth Infiltrator could be a cheaper alternative. Overall, the card, I love a new clone. And this one is inexpensive in both mana cost and monetary value, sitting at 25 cents. Bye, bye, bye. This is a buy. It's easily play. And the Lumbering Mega Slot, this card, you're going to see more and more attention drawn to this card, especially in Legacy. And this is interesting because when a card from the new sets goes straight to Legacy, they definitely see a price tick. This thing was sitting at about 10 bucks just a couple of days ago. It's trickled back down to $6.99. But let's imagine with Corey Williams here for a moment that this card was playable and modern, okay? This pick might be a little more silly and less impactful. Not that any of these other picks aren't after all. Big bulky creatures not called Primeval Titan or Cultivator Colossus seem to have few opportunities to flourish in modern. Having said that, the Lumbering Megathlosh could very easily find more homes in deck builds like Hardened Scales, especially with the Ozlith ensuring that all your counters remain permanently accounted for. An accounting error with this Mega Slot. This card also has Trample, so it's better to deal a little bit more damage, and this card we just imagine, if you would, with me, if the Lumbering Mega Sloth was legal in modern. Good morning, Zephyr, Cardboard Splendor, Cosmic Seeds, Michael Superbacker. Thanks for having me uh, on your stream here this morning. <clears throat> Traditional problem with this card. It costs X less to cast if Y counters are met. And this becomes a very rare to meet the optimum condition when you play it on the minimum casting cost of possible because only... The cards like Ozlith exist. And because Lumbering Megasloth cost reduction counts any counter, broadly speaking, it's easy not only to reduce its casting cost to two green, but ensure that it always stays there, making it appealing to run in a multiple, in theory, multiple copies of the sloth. It's not legendary, so a couple more 8-8s eight for your great, great deck. Again, this is a silly and hypothetical situation, and even in this meta, an 8-8 for 2 mana with Trample seems less impactful than it should be, and after all, you can simply trade 2 4, four Rhino tokens for it, thanks for nothing, Violent Outburst ban. And the other than the collateral damage to Living End, if you aren't convinced that this card is busted, then check out the Legacy deck 
that enables a potential turn zero mega sloth using crop rotation to fetch out dark depths with 10 ice counters on it, entering the battlefield in combination to pitching two spirit guides that exile it using a mox diamond or bolt. Oh yeah, don't sleep on this slow fella. This sucker is a buy. Bye, bye, bye. If you're playing budget legacy, this card could be for you. It's a way to brew some interesting and new combinations of magic the gathering deck so what the heck i digress financially speaking this card is relatively inexpensive uncommon with the recent tcg player prices asking or sitting around eight bucks don't get me started on the surge of the foil though which is on hand asking for prices of a hundred dollars each it's worth that much no but the relative scarcity of surge foil commons and uncommons versus rares and mythics creates some interesting short run price disparities we're going to take a look at this legacy deck once we run through the article stream here this morning because I really want to cover it. Nuku Koa vending machine. All right, spending your hard earned chump change over at the Nuku Koa vending machine. It reminds me of an episode of a show that I used to watch as a kid, and that was uh, I had the mice in it. Rescue Rangers, right? They had that drink on the show Rescue Rangers. It was called Cuckoo Cola, but this is a Maybe a Nuku Cola, a little bit different. Cowboy walks into a German car showroom and greets them. Audi. All right, I'm planning on directing a cowboy film. It's called The Sun It Sets in the West. What kind of dinosaur can you find at a rodeo? Well, that's a Bronchosaurus. And at first, the cowboys were struggling in their choir, but now they're an okay corral. All right, the Nuku Cola vending machine, who does? academy manufacturer work for who does the academy manufacturer work for that's right why well, the nuka cola corporation of course in all seriousness the samwise food combo decks that look really cool on paper but clunky in practice except for when they work need more janky synergistic pieces and the vending machine is the most needlessly powerful addition i could even imagine and it fits perfectly into this deck and no other deck in modern Vending Machine streams and screams combo piece as it's already proven to be exceedingly powerful in Commander. And when paired with the Academy manufacturer of Car Clan Ironworks, Rest in Peace Eggs players everywhere, Peregrine Tools, and many other cards that benefit from sacrificing ample artifacts or generating ample artifact tokens, the Nuku Gorilla Vending Machine has a lot going on with it. There's a lot of ongoing debates, however, about what the long room financial price potential of a blue black and followed is but the market is mostly stabilized in the sense that the price volatility seems to be minimal with the exception of a few cards and surge foil showcase like the wise mothman and surge foil lumbering mega sloth that come to mind even while the market seems to have mostly settled in the short run for now nuka cola vending machine still reminds remains the most in demand single card from the pre-constructed decks in non-foil non-borderless version of the straightforward science deck going for around twenty dollars the borderless surge foil version however will run you about 80 bucks or so interestingly as well the borderless vault boys style cards in the last two slots of the collector's booster pack the new Coca-Cola vending machine is the only outright new pre-con card to have received such a treatment it's very clear that wizards of the coast recognized the power and potential of this card from the outset giving it such a treatment right up alongside Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Farewell, Wasteland, Ravages of War, Vandal Brass, Crucible, Worlds, and Command Tower. But in summary, if we're being honest, the heart of this article isn't so much centered around modern per se, although it's nice fantasy to imagine some of these Universe Beyond products making their way into modern. Having said that, the Fallout is a contemporary magic product which makes it modern defini definition... Def definitionally speaking right and all seriously i felt compelled to offer my two cents on the product and some choice cards from it that really strike me and strike a chord with a part of me that loves fallout as a property and a part of me that looks at cards not only in terms of their value in commander but also their potential value in modern even if hypothetically where do these cards end up in the long run the trends as i see it point towards the surge foil variants and the borderless vault boy cards and surge foil showcase precon cards being the real money makers in the set hold on to those cards and likely the only non-serialist 
sterilize cars to hold real long-term value. Notwithstanding this, there's a striking amount of value nested within the surge foil bobbleheads, which seem to rotate in sold-out status over on TCG Player Daily, as well as some surprising value in surge foil commons and uncommons, which are really difficult to pull or accumulate relative to surge foil lands, rares, and mythic rares. Of course, the Nuku Cola vending machine will hold value for the reasons described in a similar vein. I would expect the Pip Boy 3000 to also hold its value over given time. The utility and flexibility that it provides, as well as an accommodating mana cost, so accommodating that it can be put directly into play with Urza Saga. Finally, of course, there are a number of serialized bobbleheads which are still mostly falling on a day to day basis on TGG Player and likely need more time to arrive in equilibrium and price. Thank you so much, Corey Williams. This has been an entertaining little fun thought piece. What happens if these suckers were modern legal? Corey Williams, this, this fella has a mind for finance like no other, and it shows and it glows in his articles when he writes them. Some of the pieces here from Corey, the assistant professor in economics in Shippensburg University, Shippensburg, Pennsylvania, considers himself a macroeconometrician with his research body reflecting work applied in macroeconomics and economics. An econometrician. Corey Williams is a level one judge who started playing Magic around 8th edition and enjoys Modern Commander and ETH Cube while drafting outside of Magic likes running, teaching, and the occasional cult movie. I would say some of the movies that he mentioned here. I'm going to have to check some of these out. All right. Let's take a look at this Legacy deck. So, oh, what the heck? The Legacy deck? Let's check it out. Now, 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 that, we're, we're, now that we've piled through this article, Beautiful article here this morning. Let's talk about this legacy deck and the lumbering mega sloth. This is a deck and a card that we're going to see some interesting, interesting headlines or legacy sloth. So what are we playing in the sloth deck, right? In this article, we discussed with Corey Williams that the legacy sloth can be played as early as turn one. And when combined with a dark depth and a thespian stage that makes you a flying 2020 indestructible merit lage token, having an 8-8 trample to go alongside of that is an ex this existential threat to your opponents and it adds a little bit of game dynamic to the already powerful creature beatdown deck that is the land stack so let's take a look at the mega sloth running spirit guys for fast mana this is how we're going to be able to get our two green on turn one and that or with a mox diamond the lumbering mega sloth we've got a play set of those in here crop rotation of course this card is expensive as a card that was printed in the Urza's block at Common, this thing commands a bit of a price tag, especially in the foil version. A very expensive card for a Common and foil. I think it's one of the most expensive Commons that I've ever seen in the game of Magic the Gathering. We're also playing one life from the loam, three once upon a time, because this is going to help filter through your deck before you play any spells to go find the Mega Sloth and add it to your hand. Two Not of This World. This is an Eldrazi card for seven mana. Counters a spell or an ability that targets a permanent you control troll. This spell costs seven less to cast if it targets a spell or ability of a creature you control with power seven or greater. What are we countering with this? Oh my goodness. It's free spell if it counters something with power seven or greater. We count or, or... Oh, I guess this is, per, this is this is to stop people from removing your Mega Sloth. You got the Pithing Needle, of course. Any addition of the Lands deck plays the Pithing Needle in the main board, and you got to tune up on your Legacy matches because Legacy is a game where knowing the meta game is important is playing properly. Cards like Pithing Needle in this deck they go right into the main board, so you got to really kind of know what you're up against to name the right card, and quite often the combo piece or the piece that makes your opponent's lands work. The shock land or the fetch lands are a good example of that. You can shut them off. And then the shadow spear, which can give your mega slot plus one plus one trample and lifelink. Three copies of exploration, one bajuka bog just for graveyard shenanigans that your opponents are trying to play. We got the beside you who endures, the dark dab, forest ghost quarter, Caracas, lush Puerto Rico. No, Portico, lush. This is the surveil land, gets it into the battlefield. Sajiri Step, Thespian Stage, Urza Saga, Windspit Heath, Yavamaya Cradle of Growth to make that sweet, sweet green mana in order to cast your Mega Sloth a little bit earlier on. To the side, we're running Swords, Veil of Summer, Endurance, Force of Vigor. I have to have a little sneeze here this morning. All right, this stream's a breeze. And thanks for sneezing with me here this morning. It's Brody Alfonso here on the morning show. We got viewers tuning in. 
from all over the world. We're talking Fallout. We're talking Outlaws of Thunder Junction. We're talking spoilers. We're talking prices of Magic cards to see what's going on in the world. Let's take a look here. Two cowboys are marooned in the desert. One of them spots a tree that's covered in bacon in the distance. He gets up and runs to the tree of bacon excitedly. However, as he gets to the tree, he's shot to death. As it turns out, it wasn't a bacon tree. It was a ham bush. Ah. Great article this morning. Thanks for joining me here this morning. Those of you who like to crack open packs, shuffle up stacks of Magic the Gathering cards, you like to get a little bit of fun in your collection. I had some new viewers yesterday, and it was great to converse with you folks and the thirst for knowledge, a fellow joining us from North Carolina here for the first time. And if anybody's here for the first time, don't worry, nobody's going to call on you in the comment section for, you know, put you on the spot for anything. But if you feel like participating, you can have hit that smash button, you can hit that like button, and you can help the channel know that we're trying to grow this stream up into the stratosphere with you fine viewers. And as we grow, we're going to be providing more stuff, interesting things for the, for the, uh, for the channel. I've been writing a couple of articles and my opinion pieces <clears throat> over on the Patreon. If you want to join that, you can join it for free, and you can join me over there. Uh, there's also paid subscriptions if you want to join the Patreon, and we'll be rolling out some Brody t-shirts at some point here in the future to, to pay thank you to those patrons who tune in and support us here on the channel. It's been great having all of you with us and seeing everybody here. Gary Hickman, nice to have you here. My big brother from another mother. Gary, how you doing, Gary Jodder? Nice to have you here. Where do we go from here? AI-generated cards, some news articles. What do we have? What do we have to discuss here this morning? All right, we should get moving and get shaking. What's that sound? It's time for your movers and shakers. Let's head on over to the, the, the fish page where we wish page of cards of new printings. And today is, we got Modern Monday, Tuesday Pioneer, Whopper Wednesday, Thursday Legacy. That's why I was excited to do the show. There's no way I could cancel it. It's Legacy is one of my favorite days when we get to take a look at some of the movers and the shakers and the cards that are making the talk this week in the format of Brody's Choice Legacy. Let's take a look over there and see what we can see. What's moving? We'll maybe take a quick peek at some of the new Outlaws of Thunder Junction cards to see what cards are making headlines, just like Corduroy Pillow. And did you hear that the world's largest bed sheet was just discovered? We'll have more on that as the story unfolds. Modern stinks at the moment. Did you say modern stinks or modern stinks? Ah, tune in with me here where we take a look at the price of the magic cards. These outlaws of Thunder Junction, some of these cards are moving and some of them are shaking. We saw the Oko yesterday. Make the Broco cost you $39 to get it into your collection. Already cards from the new set coming out the gate at 30 bucks or more to get them to your door. Maybe you're better off to open them. I'm exercising some patience, financial responsibility at this point in time in the world of Magic the Gathering because I am not paying the premium price for new products. I'm waiting till they get on overstock. What my prediction is, is that a lot of these cards, these new sealed products, because we got three releases out at the moment. We got Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Spoilers just released. Those are on pre-order. We got Modern Horizons 3 on pre-order. And we've already got the Assassin's Creed on pre-order. Do you think the pre-order is going to fill? How much of this stuff are people willing to put their money out in advance? to get it into their collection. I am I am very confident that the strength in the Magic the Gathering market as far as people having disposable income to dump into new sets and do box openings is not there yet. I think Wizards of the Coast is heavily mistaken in launching so many of these products all at the same time, thinking that every single person out there has got the capacity financially to go out and buy every single product. They're not going to do it. A lot of those cards, if you're patient and you wait just a little bit, you'll get them on overstock for a reduced price if you're willing to sit out and just watch the prices of Magic the Gathering cards with me. And I believe that's happened already with the Murders of Karloff Manor set where that stuff's going on sale because they couldn't sell it all. If that's not selling all of it in one shot, 
then there's definitely going to be a restock on some of these new products after the pre or pre-order period is over. So just be patient. If there's any of these cards, maybe just buy singles. What do we got here? Frontline Seeker. Front and center here. This is another mount. Is this a mount or is it a scout? All right, one white and one for a 2-1. Whenever Frontline Seeker enters the battlefield, look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a mount and creature a mount creature card or a planes card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Is this getting some synergy? It's up 111% for this Frontline Seeker rare. A 2-1, it's a common. This can't be. No, it's uncommon. $5 uncommon. Any decks to talk about? No decks found. So it's still early in the in the release of this. People haven't put out any deck lists speculating on this. Thunder Lasso. This equipment card. We've got colored artifacts coming back. When the Thunder Lasso enters the battlefield, attach it to target creature you control. A quick creature gets plus one, plus one. And whenever a crit creature attacks, tap target creature of defending player controls. This is like a hammer skull ability from Ixalan. It's kind of an annoying mechanic when people are tapping down your stuff. Like the Ancrop Crusher that says target creature can't block. This is uh, Lasso. It seems a little expensive. It gets to equip it for free for three mana. And just tapping down your opponent's blocker from the uncommon slot. Is that worth $2.71? Hard to say. You can play some creatures that already have that evergreen mechanic built into it. And Caught in the Crossfire is up 81% just based on spoilers alone. These are sort of pre-release prices. So if you're watching and you're looking at any of these spoilers, and there's cards that you really want to get, this is a good way to kind of get an idea of what these things are going to cost you. This instant speed uncommons. A lot of uncommons showing up here this morning from the new set. Spree. This is the interesting mechanic that is new in the game of Magic the Gathering. And as we pointed out yesterday, you see the spree mechanic. There's a plus sign on the top of the Magic card right here. This is a new addition to the border of cards in Magic the Gathering. It has a plus sign reminding you that you have to pay some additional costs. Now, for me, the jury is still out. I am not too sure whether this spell, when it's on the stack, counts as a two-drop. So can this thing be spell-snared as a two-cast, or does it add the spree cost in addition to it? Spree, instant speed, caught in the crossbow, deals two damage to each outlaw creature. Assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks are all outlaws. Or caught in the crossfire deals damage to each non-outlaw creature. Two. Two damage to each outlaw or two damage to each non-outlaw. So if you're playing outlaws, this thing can be for you to uh, maybe pyroclasm your opponent's creatures, leaving yours safe. Oh, and I have another speculation here. Thanks to Benson. Let me just quickly find this. here. Give me two seconds. Here's an interesting speculation from my friend Benson and friends. I'm really stoked because Benson gave me this tip here yesterday. He said, here's an interesting speculation for you folks on the stream. Let's take a look at this card. Decent card. How about this card? Mercadian Mass. Tataran Summons. This is a tutor card. Speaking of odd mana tutors, one mana tutor for sorcery speed. This one, what do you think of this card? I think this card, for the price it is, it's out of stock right now. It's 69 cents. Let's just, just give this one a buy. Search your library for a mercenary card. Reveal that card, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. If mercenaries ever make a comeback in the world of Magic the Gathering, this card in the tribal slot will do it just for you. The thing is 69 cents. It's a decent black tutor. If you haven't ever thought of playing mercenary tribal, there could be a point in the future where, you know, we've got outlaws. Now there were rebels. And then now there's, you know, there's just generic creature type merfolk and stuff. But this group of creatures, like we see here on some of these outlaws of Thunder Junction, it's an interesting speculation because now that we have uh, the outlaws, including assassins mercenaries pirates rogues and warlocks this card can definitely have some legs it's definitely got some legs where'd it go it's got where'd it go yeah search your library for a mercenary card reveal that card and put it into your hand so this works with the new uh new new creature tribe mechanic nice pick benson very very nice pick so this is a, uh, what's the foil version worth? I want to check this card out. Cataran Summon. Thank you for Benson for this one. I want to share some specs here. Cataran Summon.
Now, now Brody has to sell Chatteran, right? Chatteran. It's like a catamaran, but a Chatteran. Chatteran summons for Acadian Mass Foil. 28 bucks for the foil version of this card. What's the tabletop price? It hasn't really moved. And look at this speculation. This is a beauty. This is a beauty. This card? This card? This card? Is a buy. Definitely. I would pick this up. Even if you can't get the non-foil version into your collection, I would say this card is worth hitting. Why not? If uh, we get a little bit more support from mercenaries in the new set, like uh, we're just getting spoilers out, and maybe some of the game mechanics haven't at all all been sort of discovered as this card uh, is overlooked. Bye, bye, bye. This card's definitely a buy for 69 cents. How can you go wrong? It was high up in modern horizons and lead up to modern horizons perhaps that's because people thought that we would get a like a re uh redux or a reboot of mercenaries and then it never happened and now we're sort of seeing it fall down in price and around the dominaria set the foil version here we're talking about was as high as 40 bucks it's hit bottom <clears throat> this one here is definitely hit bottom at 30 bucks so a mercadian mass foils oh my goodness i gotta get off the stream right now folks i gotta just quit the stream altogether because I want to go make a purchase on this card. I'm actually so excited about this because I'm super bullish on Mercadian Mass Foils and Cataran Summons is no exception. Oh, we got any in stock? Is there any in stock? You can race me there. 12 bucks sold out. If you can find this card at any of the vendor shops, what was the pre uh, the pre existing price for $12.99? This is a decent speculation. Stopping through, Mr. Anger Collections. Yo, yo, yo. Nice to see you. And me, Mr. DJ is rolling through in the stream here this morning we're talking specs we're talking picks we're talking mercenaries all you magic the gathering mercenaries who love the game as much as i do i'm quite hyped about this card right all right katarin summons a great pick thanks to benson uh give that guy a follow head on over to his youtube channel because he's got some great shorts over there very entertaining if you want to if you got a sense of humor if you've got no sense of humor, don't bother going over there. But if you've got a sense of humor, I would check it out. He does some Google Translation cards and a few comparative shorts that make me kind of giggle, chuckle. And uh, I enjoyed the conversation with him over on X. So let's see. Caught in the crossfire, we're talking about mercenaries here as a creature type. We're talking about the Cataran Summons as a speculation that works with mercenaries. And the lassoed by the law card for a one, white, and three is an enchantment that says by the Lasso of the law entering the battlefield, excite target non land permanent and opponent controls until lassoed by the law enters the battlefield. This is like a white enchantment removal card. When lassoed by the law enters the battlefield, create a 1 1 red mercenary creature token with tap. Target creature you control gets 1 0 until end of turn and activate. This is only as a sorcery. This is uh, up 81%. Is this another uncommon? Yeah, a bunch of uncommons making here. Mercenaries are back in junction. And all the mercenary cards from Mercadian Mass Block are worth getting into. Fleeting Reflection? Nice pick, Benson. Thanks for the heads up on that one. And this is why we do the show, because, like, I learn as much from you folks as you may learn from each other. And I like the group discussion. 64 heads are better than one. And, uh, and that's what we like to do when we get the fun into our collection, where we take a look at these objectively and see, like, where do you want to go with this? Like, where I would rather have the Katarin summons in my collection at 69 cents right now if i can find it rather than waiting a couple of weeks before the metagame is solved with the new outlaws of thunder junction set that comes out and then realizing hey now that card's five bucks i want to play it i could have got it for 69 cents which is like it's peanuts it's so little to get that into your collection you may it may have it's got legs boys it's got legs. It's got so many legs. This card's got legs. It can do stuff. It can move. What's this one? Fleeting Reflection? This one's one blue and a one for an instant speed. Target creature you control gains Hexy-proofy until end of turn and untap the creature until end of turn. It becomes a copy of up to one target creature. Oh, can you say Hidden Strings or any of the Stitcher Supplier type decks? This thing is going to get broken, I'm for sure. Like this get it untaps and becomes a copy of something else at instant speed for one turn. This need for speed this card with fleeting reflection. Definitely pretty cheap. 81% up is it a common slot? Is it another common all uncommon. Uncommon, 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 uncommon. Where's the money, Brody? 
It's down here somewhere. I'll find it. Where's the money, Brody? Uh, just let me take another look for it. I'm pretty sure it's down here. The money is in the uncommon slot by the looks of it. All right, the dude abides and the bro abides with the stream here for you folks watching at home. Botanical Sanctum getting another reprint. I think this was a card that was printed in the Kalajest block, if I'm not mistaken. I wonder how that's gone ahead and done it. Yes, Kaladesh, foil version. These things, some people like, these are the fast lands. And I would say pick these up. These are quite, quite good. $5.21. Some of the fast lands, especially the black red ones, are actually about 20 bucks. And I, when I was putting together a Pioneer build, I had to shell out a couple of bu bucks for the Copper Lion Gorge. Let's take this look. Copper Lion Gorge. Here's a card. I think it only has like one print in it. $4.70. Zendikar Expeditions. Is it the Copper Lion Gorge? Scars of Meriton is eight bucks. So these are the fast lands that enter the battlefield untapped unless you have two or fewer lands. And people complain about not having the dual lands, but these are fast lands. So if you have them in your opening hand, they're just as good as a dual land. This one's as good as a tropical island if you're playing it on turn one or turn two or even turn three. It's actually quite good. The only thing it... Okay, maybe it's not as good because it doesn't have the basic land type so you can search for it, but it is good in standard and modern and even Pioneer as an alternative to some of these more expensive dual lands that are out there. This one's seen a reprint, and there's some of these fast lands that are quite expensive, and land is always a good real estate choice. If you're opening packs, if you're going to draft, and this is in your, if you're playing limited, and you're going to like a sealed event, and you're like rare is like a botanical sanctum, and you're like using the build strategy of bread, bombs, removal, evasion, uh, aggro, and discard or the whatever the moniker is bombs removal evasion aggro and draw this card doesn't fit any of those slots it's not a bomb it's not removal it's not evasion it's not aggro and it's not card draw but it's like your rare slot this will show up in a draft or it'll show up in a limited event like where you're playing sealed and you're probably going to want to pass it because it's not going to be in your color myself if I'm going to a limited event and I see these cards, I am so tempted to pick them up because the good lands in the rare slot are always worth money. You can walk away, even if you don't win in the draft. Now, it's going to be difficult if you've got, you know, if you've got pack one, pick one, and you're like, well, botanical sanctum. It could turn, then you're kind of slotting yourself directly into that color suit. But it's something to think about if you're doing draft and you're opening packs for some value later on down the line. If you can build around it and make use of it in limited play, this is a decent pickup because they always tend to hold around five to 10 bucks. In other finance news, that piece of human garbage, SBF, is going to jail for years. Greg's trash, <laughs> as well as Brea. All right, Botanical Sanctum seeing a reprint. I don't know which art you like as well, but this card here, Gitrog. There's a card. Let's take a look at this card. Here's a boy, and we have it featured here on the thumbnail of the stream here this morning. This card, why is this card? I saw this card bouncing up at around $34, and this is pre-order pricing, right? The set's not even out yet, and this is the price for some of these cards. $34 for a direct-to-standard card opening. Now, this card could just flop, fall on its face. It could be a little less more potent than people expected it to be, or it could just be everything and more that people want it to be, and it could be yours for a mere $34.99. I'm very leery about buying singles for the $35 to $50 mark on pre-order because we've seen that happen a number of times where cards get printed and they think they're going to be worth lots of money, and then they just, they just tank horrifically. This is a mount. All right, let's see the Gitrog Ravenous Ride. It's another cool froggy card, another Gitrog for the deck here. The 6-5 for 5 mana in the uh, Golgari colors for a black, a green, and 3. This uh, Gitrog Monster, Monstrous Ride, deals combat damage to a player. You may sacrifice a creature that saddled it this turn. So I guess the saddle one is like, is like it's like proof for equipments. So whenever Gitrog Ravenous Monster, or Ravenous Ride deals combat damage to a player, you may sacrifice a creature that saddled it this turn. So you gotta like, you gotta put a sacrificial cowboy on this sucker. Oh, the poor cowboys. 
If you do, draw X cards and put up to X land cards from your hand onto the battlefield where X is the sacrifice creature's power. So, you, you know, on the tokens deck, you get to draw one and something better. You get to draw a little bit more and then you get to put that uh, some land onto the battlefield. So it ramps you. It's actually quite good. I wonder how I wonder how effective this is going to be, especially in like a lands build. It's hard to say. Perhaps commander is where people are thinking this is going to see play. And here's the. All right, here's the card I wanted to cover. Get out and get going. This card here, very interesting. Tiny Bones. There's a lot of... This card, I think, was spoiled earlier. Two cowboys are marooned in the desert. One of them spots a tree covered in bacon. <laughs> Tiny Bones. And he picks his bones clean. Then how do cowboys send out secret messages? In horse code, of course. Let's look at this Tiny Bones card. One mana for a 1-1. One, one. This pickpocket, skeleton rogue. It's got some good creature tribal type on it. It's got Death Touch. And when Tiny Bones, the pickpocket, deals combat damage to a player, you may cast target non-land permanent from that player's graveyard. And mana of any type can be spent to cast this card. This card's got legs. It's got so many legs. This card, what is it pre-ordering for? I'm very surprised. I'd be very surprised. 30 bucks. I'd be surprised if this wasn't as high as is less than the Gitrog monster. For one mana, you get the rogue creature type. This thing lets you uh, deal combat damage to a player and then play any card that's a permanent, non-land, out of an opponent's graveyard. Spending mana of any color, this thing is going to be hot in Commander. I think there's going to be lots of people who are going to want to play it. It's legendary. Perhaps legendary skeletons is going to be a thing. Hard to say, but this card definitely has some legs. It's going to be interesting to see. Who loves this mythical skeleton cowboy tiny bones for the future? Speaking of mounting, the Gitrog monster stops with a jerk. And then the jerk falls off and gets sacrificed. What else we got here? Selvala the Eager Trailblazer. A what do we call this? Selesnia. A Selesnia card. Elf Scout of 4-5 for a white and a green and two. You get a legendary elf scout. Elves are back. And when you cast a creature spell, create a 1-1 mercenary token with tap. Target creature you control gets 1-0 until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. So this card also taps, choosing a color. and Add one mana of that color for each different power among creatures you control. So it's like a really powerful mana door. It's a kind of expensive. Hard to say how... How, how is this worth the 30 bucks? It's probably being looked at as a commander card to build around and add elves into and make uh, make more mana, perhaps in a Selesnia commander build. It'll be interesting to see that card's up here on their movers and the shakers. And Annie Flash, the veteran. All right, Annie. Annie's flashing us all this morning for this four or five. Cost you a white. It's a Naya, a white, a green, and a red, and three legendary human rogue with flash, and then enters the battlefield. If you cast it, return target permanent card with mana value three or less from your graver to the battlefield tap. So it's got Unearth written right on the card for flash speed. And then whenever any flash becomes tapped, exile the top two cards of your library and you may play those cards these turns. So just tap her and then you get to play. When she flashes you, you just tap her and then you get to play a couple of cards off the top of your library. Okay, well, that's it. That's all. There is no more. Just kidding. It's Legacy Thursday, and we got no time limit because Brody worked late last night. Was up till about 1.30 in the morning, didn't get home till about 2. I had a little bit of a snooze. I got up and I said, okay, it's time to do the morning show. We got to talk about Legacy. Hot Dice. Where's Hot Dice? Hot, where are you? Where's the Hot Dice here this morning? Hot Dice? Where are you? Is that you in the back, Hot Dice? I'm looking, I'm looking for Mr. Hot Dice here this morning. I got to get some snakes in the stream this morning because the card... On the top of the Legacy Movers and Shakers list is one of my all-time favorites. And you can hate me for it and put some snakes in the comment section below. But it's this card. Winter Orb. It's up. The Unlimited Winter Orb seeing 200 bucks. There's my buddy. Thanks, Hot Dice. Nah, it may not be my favorite card, but this card gets a lot of attention. It does. It's $205.30 for the Winter Orb from Unlimited. And this card is creeping up in price 18%, and there's all kinds of ways to play it. It's usable in Commander. It can be used with uh, 
tabernacle of the Penderal Vale to make your creature, opponent's creatures have an upkeep cost. Yes, boo, hiss, winter orb, a card everybody loves to hate. Uh, it's like you can't knock it. Don't knock it till you try it, right? Winter orb. All right, what are we playing with this card? OMG. Well, I know it's played in Commander. It's a lock piece. It's a stacks piece. It slows down the game to an incredibly slow pace. I'll tell you, you do want to have a way to defend yourself if you play this because you will instantly defriend yourself with the other folks in the game. Yes. <laughs> Less card. All right. Friends off with the winter orb. But I like to track the prices of these magic cards. Quite interesting to see. The revised copy is uh, going to be a lot cheaper. This card's been trending down in price for some time and it's just recently take a poke up in price. And it could be because that there's some new decks using it. I always want to take a look at it. Here we got Urza, the Lord High Artificer, using it. Yukuri, the Tiger Sa Shadow. Arbiter of Augustine the Third, Revy the Imperial Tactician, Preston Gavy the Minuteman, <laughs> Mr. Minuteman, Beanstalk Control, Nekizar, Mind Razor, and Elivere the Wild Hoard, Maria the Scholar of Antiquities, Slicer the Hired Muscle. This is something all these commander decks are going to be playing. Beanstalk Control in Legacy. What's it running? We're running four copy of the Bone Master, one Emissary of Tress, four Murktide Regents, four Brainstorm, two Fatal Push, four Ponder, three Stifle, four Days, one Shoulders Edict, two Wither Bloom Command, four Force of Will, two Lorien Revealed, and two Murderous Cut. Enchantments, we got the four up to Beanstalk, we got the three Misty Rainforest, and a bunch of lands. In the sideboard, we got the Carpet of Flowers, Fatal Push, Draft Digger's Cage, and a bunch of MacGuffins in there bad you're bad man brody you're bad man why do you like this card well there's definitely different ways to break it if you want to play the relic barrier this card is quite cheap a good card and i like this relic barrier because i can get the legends version for six dollars and 35 cents for this uncommon it costs two mana which is the same amount of mana as the winter orb and you can cast it off of a soul ring as early as turn one and then you can tap it to tap the winter orb so you get to untap your lands it's also an artifact so you've got the affinity mechanic going with it and then you can use the uh the affinity for artifacts like to tap the winter orb to pay for another spell which allows you to untap your lands during your untap step because they all untap simultaneously with the untap step what cards can we play at instant speed that have affinity for artifacts good question Another good way to use and abuse this card. Volcanic Island from the Revised set. This is another dual land creeping up on the list here this morning in the Legacy slot. Volcanic Island from Revised, $699. OMG, I remember the days where we were able to be able to pick up Volcanic Islands in Unlimited for that exact same price. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. I bought Revised instead because I was trying to save bread and it all went to my head. Here, this card has been trending down in price and the, the, the Revised Dual Lands are probably going to go lower until later on this year into midpoint of 2025. Until we see a little bit, like, a little bit more money circulating around in people's hands. Like, the cost of inflation is causing people not to have a lot of disposable income. And I don't blame you if you're going to be buy listing cards and trying to like get store credit and not wanting to spend cash on magic cards, like going out and spending $699 on a single copy of Volcanic Island. There's got to be other ways to get it. You want to be trading and buy listing to try and get one of these in collection. And, and because of such, because there's like so many people that are like, myself included, it's like struggling. I went out for supper yesterday, Mrs. Alfonso and I, we went out for supper. I had a hamburger and fries, like a, just a straight up hamburger and fries. Miss Alfonso had a bowl of ramen soup and a side of chicken wings, eight chicken wings. And then uh, no, no alcohol. We just had a, one iced tea and a glass of water. That cost $83. I was like, oh, my goodness. How is this even sustainable? So $83 for a hamburger, a bowl of soup, and some chicken wings and an iced tea? And the thing is, the, weird, the world is getting weird. So, like, I'm... Uh, where I'm speculating is that, like, because cardboards and cardboard accessories are, like, a supplementary, this is not an essential. Like, I mean, I don't know how anybody who's eating volcanic islands for dinner to, like, sustain themselves or burning them in their fireplace to, like, keep their house warm. So people are more focused on paying their bills and, and these overinflated prices for, like, fuel 
uh, any of the regular goods, cost of living, and day-to-day necessities. But uh, until we see a little bit of a change uh, throughout 2025, later this year, maybe halfway through 2025, I think it's gonna things are gonna turn around and get a little bit better for the working man and the working lady who are out there working as best as they can to put cardboard on the table in the best of times. So when that happens, once things turn around financially for the majority of working folks who are out there just, you know, putting in their, just like me, putting in your hours, clocking the, you know, punching the clock, trying to take home your paycheck, pay for your bare necessities. Once that turns around and people are stealing, feeling a little more comfortable uh, with the, the world and economics, then, the, then we're going to see these cards, these reserve list staples are going to trend down in price until such time as people have a little bit more market buying power. And that's reflected in a couple of ways. And we discussed it on an article by, I think it was Harvey McGinnis, where were the, that was the, the three main indicators of the Magic the Gathered financial market. And the revised dual lands and the dual lands as a whole are a pretty strong indicator as the market strength as it relates to the buying power as the whole of all the players who are uh, who are buying Magic cards. It's a good indicator. As these cards drift down in price, it means that people are not putting their money into these things and they're going to drift down a little lower. The other thing is sealed product. And when we look at some of these sealed product, these sites that are selling sealed product, let's take a look over at face to face games. We've got like, we've got like murders of Karlov Manor on overstock sale. And then we've got Modern Horizons 3 on pre order. And then we've got Assassin's Creed also on pre order and Outlaws of Thunder Flumption also on pre order. So we got three sets on pre order, one set on clearance. So, like, what does this indicate to you as far as the strength of the financial market for players as a whole? There's not everybody's not got extra money to like pile into all these new products and buy a reserve list cards. So, this is going to be a little bit of a slap in the face. I think we're probably going to see uh, Wizards. Of the, this is like the Marie Antoinette let them eat cake sort of a mentality. It's like the economy's in the toilet. Let them buy magic cards. It's like, but with what money, Brody? So the, the, there's people, and I love to see this case on Twitter where people are like, hurry, print the revised dual lands, make them common, give them to everybody. I think those people fail to realize that the entire reserve list as a whole, the, the, like if you take the whole reserve list and you take like each section of it and you consider like the, the alpha, beta, and unlimited dual lands as like a slice of the pie of the value of like all magic the gathering cards the revised alpha beta and unlimited dual lands form up the largest pie share of value and price and money in the entire game of magic the gathering it's like the largest piece of the single piece of the pie when it comes to um when it comes to like magic the gathering market share and like to reprint those and like make them common in five dollars would like it would just it's like I just want to crash the stock market so that I can pick up cheap stocks. But at that point, we've got bigger problems because then that's going to cause all other kinds of dominoes to fall. The trust issues, players and collectors. I mean, don't get me wrong. If uh, if they were to reprint and I think with Power Creep, they're probably going to reprint something better. Like we already got Triome. So let's just like make a Triome that enters the battlefield untapped. Then it's better than the dual lands. And like we're already getting six fives for four mana that are like have flash and like an upside to them. So like now it wouldn't be uh, far fetched to see some like better lands than even uh, they can make better cards. But if they were to reprint them and people were to pitch them and say, okay, I'm selling out of magic, we'll get some money for these before like they, you know, they go to zero. I would say that would be a point where you want to like pick up some more of these cards. Island of Whack Whack. Here's an Arabian Nights rare, an interesting card. I'm not answering. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good morning, sunshine. Sunshine and lollipop here this morning. We're discussing a reserve list cards. We're talking legacy. We're talking dual lands. We're talking finance. And we're talking the island of Wacky Wacky. This is a rare card from Arabian Nights. And this card, you know, when the Bazaar of Baghdad card got bought out, let's just drag this back. This little 
this little chart of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This area here between 2021 and 2022 is quite an interesting and tumultuous period of time for Magic the Gathering. Let's take a look at the Bazaar of Baghdad. Another, uh, da, 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 another, another reserve list card. Another reserve list card. Let's take a look at this one here from Arabian Nights. A rare card, $24.99. Let's pull back the chart. And like, if you don't see some correlation to this, then you, you got to get your eyes checked. Well, let's take a look here. Right around January 2021, this card spiked incredibly high. And then like, this is when it was bought out. This card was bought out and masked by a bunch of speculators who were like, this card's good. It's busted in vintage. It's one of the better cards. That and Mishra's Workshop, let's buy all of them. So this card was like bought out in and around 2021. So now let's like take one step back and go to uh, go to the Island of Whack Whack and just pull back the chart and look at the exact same time period for this card. Round and around the exact same time. So like after the Bazaar of Baghdad buyout, people were looking to the Arabian Nights set and realizing how rare this set was. And like, and some people like myself took a look and said like, what other lands are in the Arabian Nights set in the rare slot that are as rare because they are going to be just as rare as the Bazaar of Baghdad. They might not be as playable as, at, or as good, but as a collectible, they're going to be just as rare and hard to get. And the Island of Whack Whack is one of them. Another card that's also expensive and from the Arabian Nights set. Now this card, it, it's a, it, all it is is a land, and it's, it's an, again, a land. And what other lands in the rare slot from Arabian Nights are there? There's the Island of Wack Wack, and there's also this one, Diamond Valley. Diamond Valley, there's a case in point for Diamond Valley being a little bit better. This one's a 1000 bucks. You, you tap it and sacrifice a creature to gain pow, uh, life equal to the sacrifice creature's toughness. It's like just about like a sorts the plowshares on a land. This thing will let you... See, and again, right around the same time as Bazaar of Baghdad was bought out, then people sort of jumped on this and said, hey, let me buy some other Arabian Nights Latins cards that are also in the rare slot because the rarity speaks for itself. This is an interesting card. This is $999. So the Arabian Nights, although it says uncommon, Arabian Nights rare, Bazaar of Baghdad, Island of Wack Wack, Elephant Graveyard, Diamond Valley, and any of the Arabian Nights uncommons and rares are also quite good. Good long-term speculation is not just based on play value. Of course, the Bizarre Baghdad takes the cake because it's played so heavily in vintage and it's a busted powerhouse card that does shenanigans. But the other, as far as collectibilities, the Island of Wack Wack is no exception. Hazazar Taman. Hazazan Tamar. I like this card. I do. I wish I had it. It's also on the reserve list. It's on Brody's Raider. I'm going to have to pick this up at some point in time. Getting down to the Legends list. This is going to be something that you know, I have to work towards. But there's other cards that I want first, so this one's going to have to wait. Until this card gets like, um, you know, out of reach for me, I, I, I hate to see it go that way. When Hazazan Kamar enters the battlefield, you get X11 Sand Warrior creature tokens that are red, green, white, and at the beginning of your upkeep, where X is the number of lands you control at that time, when Hazazan Tamar Lays the battlefield, exile all sand warrior. So you get these warrior tokens. I wonder if they count as warriors. I'm pretty sure they do. He's also a warrior himself. He's 2 4. So, like, warriors. What are, what are, do, 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 Warriors. Let's see. Caught in the crossfire. Assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks. Okay, I was mistaken. Not warriors warlocks but tribal is something that you want to keep an eye on especially for some of these older cards that seem to work with the tribal mechanics they're kind of a bit of evergreen and they could see a reprint in any time and also the rebels i think it'd be interesting to see rebels again even though i think mark rosewater says something to the contrary that we're not going to see rebels again but we're also also seeing now outlaws mercenaries and like group of creatures that count as a subtype or like a super type of creatures I think they could be quite good. Perhaps this is why this card is moving. I want to see what the chart looks like on this. It's 200 and something bucks. It's never been lower since 2018. It's been moving down to 2021 and just a little poke up in price, perhaps with Warriors getting a little more support. And this card isn't really a big mover. It's seen a tick up in price here today, but that's only because 
it's been so low for the last little while. Any little tick up in price is going to make this card seem like it's spiking. Any decks using it has us on Sozar as a commander himself. And then what's this has us on the Shaper of the Sand? I definitely want to look at this card because it has us on get a reprint in some other set. Has us on Shaper of the Sand. This guy likes to build sand castles. I would have loved to see some sand castles. So this is Hazazan. He's got desert work. Desert work. Desert walk. Uh, Dominaria United Commander. Of course, this is going to be pushing this card. So why wouldn't you want to run both Hazazan? They're both in collar suit. This card's also a little bit cheaper. So he's better choice for your commander. He's a 3-3. Three, three. He's also a warlock. He's got, war he's got desert walk. And you may play desert lands from a graveyard. Quite good. Oh, Desert's also another card from Arabian Nights. Let's take a look at that card right after this. Whenever a desert enters the battlefield under your control, you get two 1-1 one, one red, white, and green sand warrior creature tokens. So you play a desert, you can play them from your graveyard. And like with the Ramanap ruins and these deserts that let you sacrifice them, and there's like scavenging grounds and a few other deserts, this has a lot of design, shape of sand. It actually makes perfect sense to be moving in price. It's quite good. This card... Bye, bye, bye! This card's a buy, if you ask me. What about desert, just straight up desert? No, we want just regular old desert. Is this a, a land or is the Arabian Nights version? I want the Arabian Nights desert. 10 bucks. <clears throat> Here's a common desert. This card? Buy, buy, buy. This card's a land from Arabian Nights. I'd say this is a buy for Defina Shirley. For Defina Shirley, get this card into your collection at some point in time. If you can find a minty fresh, a decent video, or a decent, <laughs> a decent video, a decent price for this card 10 bucks for an arabian knight's land tap to add a colorless mana or do one damage to an attacking creature after it's dealt its damage so this thing could like make your opponents one drops think about swinging like maybe even uh athalia she's only got one toughness anything with one toughness is going to make your opponents think twice about uh attacking you this thing's seen a reprint in a promo version from the Vault Realms and a few other ones. Myself, I'm fond. If you want long-term investability, playability, collectability, valuability, to get the Arabian Nights version, you can always get it for three bucks in another version. But if you're playing Commander and you want to run this Hazes on the Shaper of the Sand, it seems point case is to buy the $10 one from the Arabian Nights set and get it done with. What else is in this deck list? Let's take a look. Where's the deck, deck, deck? The Shaper of Sand. This guy making sand castles, making castles in the sand. All right, Herald of Dromoka, Sprouting Goblin, Azusa Lost is Seeking. Oh, yeah, you want to play additional lands during each of your turn, and now with the Hazes on, you can play Desert from your graveyard. Of course, there are Prefix, allowing you to play lands from the top of your library. This is an interesting lands build. Hazazan's lands. Diamond Hazazan's. This is a card that definitely makes me think about wanting to play a card from Legends. All these kinds of MacGuffins in here. Interesting Naya build. Or, uh, yeah, I like it. 50 cents for the Hazazan, Shaper of the Sand. Is it playing the desert? Gotta be. Lands, where's the lands list? Desert. Desert? Straight up desert. There it is there. So Hazazan making his hands felt here on the Movers and the Shakers list. And this card here, All Hallows Eve, this is like the original living end. All right? This thing doesn't have suspend, and it's not living end, but it's the same mana cause, and let's read it because we want to know exactly what it does let's take a look here all hours eve is a sorcery it's got christopher rush art on it so if you're a fan of magic the gathering at all you'll know who mr rush is the late great christopher rush one of the greatest artists of all times and this card is one of his works and it's a fantastic showpiece and an excellent art and there's very few cards that you know give you that feel of nostalgia this deep dark mysterious halloween type of art card with the spirit the cat and the jacko lantern it's a sorcery card that costs you two black and two, and at the beginning of, uh, and you get to exile All Hallows Eve with two scream counters on it. So you cast it and you put two scream counters on it, and that's like suspend counter, just like the Living End card. The thing is, with Living End, you can, uh, you can, you can cascade into it because it has no mana cost. This is a different type of a mechanic, but this is the precursor to Living End. It's the same mana cost. It gets scream counters instead of suspend counters, and at the beginning of your upkeep, it you exile. Uh, if All Hallows Eve is exiled with a Scream Counter on it, you're going to remove a Scream Counter, so basically a Suspend Counter. If there are no more Scream Counters on it, put it into your graveyard, and each player returns all creature cards from their graveyards to the battlefield. Living End also removes everything from the battlefield to the graveyard, and this just gets everything back from the graveyard, so in like a cycling deck, like the Striped River one, or any of the decks that play big cyclers, so you can just like pay one to, like, like let's look at the Striped River one. Are decks using it? Jera, the Golgari Lit Lord. 
glitching and lording here through the stream there this morning. Go Jared, the Golgari Lich Lord. This one's two black and two green. Gets plus one plus one for each creature card in your graveyard. Sacrifice another creature. Each opponent loses life equal to sacrifice a creature's power. Sacrifice a swamp and a forest. Return Jared from your graveyard to your hand. So where is the there's no green, there's no blue in there. But in a cycling deck, I would have thought to see maybe some more cycling creatures. I think that uh Hal Hallows Eve could probably be played in a cycling deck where you've got cards like the Stripe River Winder. This card here, I think, is a 5 5 with hex proof. It's fun blue to cycle it. So you just get this is a seven mana 5 5 that you're not going to be playing and casting from your hand. You're just going to play one blue, put it into the graveyard, and draw another card. And you're going to keep doing that with all the cards that have cycling on it that are cheap and that are big. And then all of a sudden, you're going to resolve this an interesting uh, living end, or you're going to resolve the All Hallows Eve, and then you're just going to bring back all those cyclers from the grave of the battlefield and crush your opponent in the face. That's how that's going to work. So that card's got legs. It's definitely a staple. Taiga, on the other hand, is a card that I was buying for 75 bucks when I got back into Magic the Gathering. I should have bought a zillion copies of it, but I bought a play set, and I stopped there. This card has got 10x in price. It's $761 for the unlimited version. The revised version, this used to be one of the cheaper cards. And it's interesting to see. A revise is $370. Okay. So it's interesting to see as far as revised dual lands. The worst ones it was Plateau and like Scrubland. Those were the color combinations that nobody played. And like Plateau, with Boros getting more and more support over the years, like the Plateau has started to creep up and not being the worst one anymore. I want to look at Plateau and see where that one's at. Because with Boros getting a bunch of support, Plateau, Alpha, Beta, Revise. Let's go to the Revise. It's 331 bucks for the Plateau, the Boros Dual Land. This card has definitely seen a tick up in price. Look at this, very stable. It used to be the, the poo-poo of all the Dual Lands. And now this card's moved up in price and is sitting at a bit of, bit of a comfortable 300 and change. It's quite expensive. And it like, and a lot of the dual lands have been trending down, and the plateau has been going sideways simply because of this card. And I'll show you why. This card. Bye, bye, bye. And I say it because if you can't afford any dual lands, then you want to start somewhere. Get the plateau or the cheapest one. I would say the plateau is probably a good place to start. This card has been moving up in price and staying steadily because the printing of better Boros cards like this card here, Fourth Aerolingus. This is a card I really want to get. But it see, it's $24. I actually want to take a re-double dip look at this card because it's been trending down in price. The last time I looked at it was $40 right around here in September. And I was like, no, I'm not buying this new printed card. I'm not buying it for that kind of money. I'm not paying $40 on a Lord of the Rings card that I could maybe open. Tales of Middle Earth. I was really hoping to open the fourth era Lingus because this, the card is even better than a ball. It's better than, it's better than Fireball. It's two mana. And X. It's a red, a white, and X. And then you get X22 two, two, white human, red and human, red. You get X22 two, two, red human creature tokens with trample and haste. So you can just pay a bunch of money into this, pay a bunch of mana into this, and get just a bunch of two twos. Instead of fireball, where it's like a red and X deal X damage, you know, you can go to the face or you can go to the ground. This thing is like a better fireball because you get creatures that stick around and like a white, a red, and X, you get that many two twos. So it's like for every mana that you pay into X, you're doing two damage if they connect. And Here's the upside on this card and why it's so good and playable in Commander. And this is why the Plateau has moved up out of last place. Even though it's one of the cheapest revised dual lands that you can get, if you're going to trade into something, start with the Plateau because eventually, you know, as the market moves up, you get one Plateau, two Plateaus. Next thing you know, you're, you're trading up into something like an all underground sea. It used to be four Plateaus to an underground sea. That was sort of the ratio. And as the underground sea moved up, it dragged all the lower ones up with it. So if you can sort of get one plateau in your collection then you're eventually in the dual land market and then if you want to upgrade and play some of the blue colors or some of the other more desirable ones at least you've got a bargaining chip and you're in the game brody so the card like this i still want this card it's for 24 usd and then whenever uh one of your one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to one or more players this turn you become the monarch now two twos are quite easy to give evasion you know, there's an even more new cards that say a target creature with power or toughness less than two becomes unblockable until end of turn. So you hit a player with this, you got the hasty boys. You can leave some of them back if you need blockers, but these things are going to trample and haste. So if you hit your opponent, you get the monarch trigger, and then you get to draw an extra card. So then the monarch is on your side, and you've got blockers to defend it. It's quite good, especially in commander, where card draw is king, and drawing extra cards makes you sing. Seeing the tega and the plateau on the list makes my ears ring. 
And this card, like Mox Diamond, is definitely a thing. It's zero mana. This card's going to $1,000. I'm telling you this card here, it is... Bye, bye, bye. If you can get it, if you can sweat it, if you can get it, this is a card worth buy listing into. And I'm not saying like, buy, 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 like go out and spend your paycheck on this card. If you've got a buy list box going and it's something that you want to trade into, this is a definite put something on your radar. This card has been actually a little bit higher in price in the past and it was creeped up to about seven or 800 bucks at one point in time. Now it's sitting at about $699 here on today, March 28th, 2024, $650 for the Mox Diamond. This is a mock. In fact, there was a lot of time it took for people to realize this card is, in fact, a mox. It's a, it's, it's a mox that costs zero mana. Yeah, you got to discard a land card and when it enters the battlefield. Okay, that's good. But it taps for any mana of any color. It's actually very, very good. It's playable in, in commander no matter what colors you're playing. It's zero mana. Sure, it gets turned off by cards like Lavinia, but it's one of the it's the only mox that you can play in commander <clears throat> that taps for all colors. Yes, you can play chrome mox. Sure. All right, but like, who cares about Chrome Mox? We want Mox Diamond. Zero mana, discard a land. You don't have to, you know, it's just, it's a little bit better than the Chrome Mox. It's like the only, uh, when I say, when I say it's the only Mox that's playable in Commander, because Moxes are generally reserve list, and this one is also reserve list. So the original Mox in that are reserve list, you know, the Sapphire, the Pearl, the Ruby, uh, the uh, Sapphire, Pearl, Ruby, Jet, and the uh, Emerald. Those are all reserve list mocks, and then this is the sixth reserve list mox. The Chrome Mox is still in print, and it still sees print to this day. So there's the evil the Mox Amber. Okay, but it's not reserve list. Then Mox Amber. Okay, I'm just gonna give it one of these. <laughs> it's okay, but you need your commander to play it. And there's been too many times when you can't even get your commander on board to make mana with the Mox Amber. It's way too situational. This one is like, if you got it in your opening hand, you got a land or two, then you're good to go. Mox Amber, it, it, it's outclassed and outshined by the Mox Diamond. And this is why I say this card, get it on your radar. If you can have, if, you're, if you've got, if, if you want to trade up into something, this is a place to park your money. Don't trade into like modern reprintable staples. If you're going to like take the bottom half of your Magic the Gathering collection and just trade it into a store for store credit, Look at the hot, hot list. All right, Benson, you're making me look bad. <laughs> Mox Lotus. Where are we here? Let's take a look at the Mox Lotus here this morning. My best buddy, Benson. You know, I love, I love, I love the guy because, like, we, we, did you know we chat on the daily, him and I? We talk, we chat, we, we, uh, we hook, uh, we send messages over on, on X, and we share thoughts and opinions about what's going on. Here's an unlimited ad. <laughs> Tapped at infinity, 100, add one mana of any color. Okay, this thing's 15. It's not legal in many formats, but God. Benson gave me some great uh, great conversation to have over on X. And if you want to join us over there on X, you can feel free to start an account or find us over on X. Uh, it's Brody Alfonso or uh, Alfonso Brody over on Twitter X. And uh, my buddy Benson's over there. We were commenting and posting and seeking out Magic the Gathering card shenanigans all the time. So the Mox Diamond, like I said, this card eventually come halfway through 2025 when we see a resurgence in economic well-being for the public at large, including uh, Magic the Gathering players where they have a little bit more buying power as a whole. Like if this was, if economic times were a whole lot better than releasing three sets on pre-release all at once would actually, they would sell. But I'm like, I'm, I'm skeptical that any of these three sets on pre-release, like the Thunder Junction, Modern Horizons 3, and the Outlaws of Thunder Junction, and the, the Commander Master, or uh, Modern Horizons 3, Assassin's Creed, and Commander Masters, they're not going to sell out. Not all three products, because there's just not enough money. The regular folks like myself who work jobs don't have the money to buy a box of each one of those sets. We're just going to say, forget about it. We're sitting it out. But when the time turns around and people have a little bit more spending power, that's where we're going to see some of these reserve list cards that have been trending down in price for quite some time, even one, two, or three years. And this card like Mox Diamond is going to go over a thousand bucks eventually. It just, it's just, it's just going to happen. Now, this one did see a reprint in a From the Vault set. Disclaimer, disclaimer. Uh, and it could probably, I wonder if that one's cheaper, but it's the only foil version of it. I just want to check the From the Vault version. There's From the Vault Relic, 650. I would be surprised. Yeah, this the foil from the vault relics one is even more expensive. It's 800 and change. So let's take a look at the price chart on that one. Is that one being even more bullish? It's kind of hard to say. 
yeah, the From the Vault Relics version of the Mox Diamond. Yes, it did get a reprint. Yes, it's from the vault. And yes, Wizards did get a tongue lashing and a pee-pee slapping from players in general when they did that. And I don't think they're going to go back to From the Vault again. At least they said they wouldn't do it. But nevertheless, this card, uh, this card's controversial. This is one of the banned cards because it's got art on it that's offensive to people. Like Crusade and like Praetis Gypsies, Invoke Prejudice, Stone Throwing Devils, and Gwendolyn de Corchy depicting a woman with a sword maybe doing things for money that she shouldn't be doing in this day and age. Okay, fine. But this is like a Julie Barrow card, some interesting art for this ginger card, Gwendolyn de Corchy. It's a Legends card, and it's a rare, and I think this card sees price action in 243 bucks simply because it's tradable, playable, and people think it's controversial, and it's never going to see a reprint based on the fact that the art on it is so ludicrously depicting a Lady of the Night. All right, this card, tap target player, discards a card at random, activate this ability only during your turn. It's a rare card, it's a 3-5, and it only costs 4 mana. Two black, a white, or two black, a blue, and a, and a red. This card, it saw a lot of price action. I think it's because Rudy from Alfonso Investments, my little brother, he, uh, he, he made a video about this card, and I think he was buying it up. And then it took a price spike up to 800 or 1,000 bucks. This card's never been lower. But let's face it, this, the, Gwen is an outlaw rogue. Is she now? Human rogue. All right. This is an outlaw. Good point, Benson. Always. You're killing me, bro. I never know. I know. No, ever know anymore when to watch your live streams lately. Well, I'll tell you, Gaming Bob is here. All right. Good morning, Gaming Bob and friends and fans of the game and the show and the bro and the D and those who know about magic cards and stuff. You can tune in. It's not that hard. And we get some MacGuffins in your Magic the Gathering content this morning. I worked late last night. I was working about 1.30 in the morning. I was up at 4.30 last yesterday. I went for a run. Then I got up. Then I did the best thing that I do all day. My favorite part of the day, I did the morning show yesterday in the early regular time slot. Then I went to work. I did a 12-hour shift, and then I caught a little snooze for about a half hour. And I went back till 1.30 in the morning, and I worked and worked and got back home in bed at about 2 o'clock this morning. And I was like, how am I supposed to get up in another three hours after working a 21-and-a-half-hour shift and do the morning show? So I slept in and said, you know what? I'm not doing nothing today. You can't make me do it. I can't answer. I, you can't make me answer the phone. You can't make me get out of bed. But I did get out of bed. Because I was like, it's legacy. It's Thursday. And I can catch a few of you amazing viewers here. What sphere are you in for work? I'm in the, I'm in the atmosphere. That's right. So I figured I'd get in and I'd, I'd do the stream this morning. And I wouldn't have any time limit to do it. Because like we're on an hour and a half long. And I don't have to like hustle and bustle to get out the door to make my commitments for the day. Because like, like the working man for the working man has got to do the best that he can. To like serve the industry and keep moving forward. Even though I got bills to pay. And I got like liabilities to, to commit to. And like I got people that I got to interact with on a daily. That today is like a day where I'm like, I just did 21 and a half hours. Give me the day off. I'm not going in. All right. What else we got? Ah, uh, Cursed Totem. Uh, let me just tell you for work, I have mastered something. There is something in the world that I have mastered. Okay. And I've, if you want to like, you know, we're talking about finance, we're talking about value, we're talking about things. Uh, Jake and Joel create an acronym for a hidden creature type for outlaw. Warm. Well, what does it stand for? Jake and Joel create an acronym for the hidden creature type for outlaw. Warm. Warriors. Okay. Did you do Cradle already? The Cradle deck is always good against Legacy most played deck. Warm P? Some more Warm P. <laughs> oh. Uh. Is that what happens when you go into the pool and you forget to use the restroom before you go in? You get the warm pee? Playing some warm pee? Curse Totem. Here's a card that was reprinted. And this came out when a Mirage was a thing. And this is quite an interesting card because you look at this card here and it's like nobody wanted to play it. This is like, give me a boo. Give me a hiss. Give me a give me a womp womp. Nobody liked this card. It's two mana. And when it came out in Mirage, nobody cared about it. And guess what? When I started playing back in Magic the Gathering, when I got back into the swing of things and I had to relearn all the formats because I came from a day of type 1 and type 2 and type 1.5. And then when I stepped away from Magic for a number of years and I got back into it, there was Modern, there was Legacy, there was Vintage, there's Standard, and there's all these other car formats that I had to relearn again because I was like playing like cards like this card, Curse Totem from Mirage. And I was like, well, that's a good card. Activated abilities and creatures can't be activated. And then all of a sudden I learned about Commander. I'm like, this is a great Commander card. 
I've been saying this, and I and I still have a copy of it from Mirage that I picked up when Mirage was out. And I'm keeping it. I'm holding it near and dear to me because I'm like, this is two mana. Creature abilities can't be activated. And like it turns out, that was one of the best things I could have done. Like this card, you look at it. This card was seeing definitely, definitely some price action because of the Yog Moth, uh, the 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 Gix deck. I think the Yog Thran Physician and the Gix. Um this here has taken a price up tick up in price, a heavy tick up in price. And look at how it crashed back down. It was like 40 bucks because like this thing was used as sideboard tech against the popular wizard, assassin, rogue, mercenary pirate. Some warm pee. I like it. I guess can we can we is it some farm W? I, yeah, it's, it's that's hilarious, Bob. Thank you. We'll keep our eye out for some warm pee. I do like Jake and Joel, the professional dog walker. Yes, right? Maybe that's what I do for a living. I'm a professional dog walker. I've got 10,000 hours in walking dogs, and I've mastered the art of it, right? No. All right, this card's a sideboard tech against cards that have activated abilities that are absolutely busted, including the Yogmoth, uh, the Yog, Thran Physician, the Gix. The Gix, I think it's the Gix card. Let's take a look at Gix. Gixy boy. Gix Braider of Yogmoth. People didn't need a way to deal with this card. Discard X cards and X another card. And then Yogmoth Thran Physician. Yogmoth Thran Physician. This guy. Discard a card and proliferate. So, like, people needed a way to beat this card, and it was like the Cursed Totem is the only way to do it. So, for two mana in any color sleuth, this is an artifact card, which is the Cursed Totem, and it, got, it goes in just about any deck. And if you're playing against the creature that has an absolute busted activate ability like the Yogmoth Thrans Physician, you need some way to deal with it. And this thing's only seen like one reprinting. Oh, Modern Rise 2 had a printing of it in 6th edition. But notice how you see the prices on these have really been quite stable. The foil for Modern Horizons 2 is 27 bucks. The Mirage, Mirage version OG Border is worth 22 And the 6th edition is worth 16 bucks, and it's still never going out of style. Cursed Totem, a great stacks piece. And then, ah, Benson. Benson. All right, you dirty dog there. How dare you? All right, here we are. Katarin Summon. Benson, like, and I can show you the timestamp of this card. Now this card has showed up on the Movers and the Shakers just like right now. This is a card that Benson texted me yesterday or messaged me on on the on 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 X, and he said, "Here's a speculation you want to talk about this card." And we were talking about it earlier this morning before we even looked at the Movers and the Shakers. Listen, this Katarin Summons is one black and it's a Mercadian Mass card. It's going to be sold out every single where, and it's going to search your library for a Mercenary card and reveal that card and put it into your hand. So Benson. I hope yesterday when you specced on this card that you went out and bought at least a couple of copies for yourself before they got sold out because a lot of people were probably sleeping on this card, but not you. Mister, like I always say. Buy low, sell high, that's my motto. I may just quit my job at the power plant and become a full-time stock market guy. Decent. Legacy. That's where we're seeing this card move and shake. So Katarin summons a like a Benson pick. So a very good, good pick. All right, we got all kinds of folks joining us this morning from all over the world. We got Gaming Bob. We got the Hot Dice. We got the Mill Master and Twice as Nice. We got the Price is Right. We got DJ Long. We got Benson in the house and Michael Superbacker when I sing in the Magic the Gathering song for everybody who tuned in this morning to track the prices of Magic the Gathering cards. I want to thank you all for tuning in, but that's not. That's, uh, but that's not all. I got time enough for one more article and let's see what we can see because I like to, I like to really get caught up here, folks. All right. Uh, uh, just a little plug for the stream here. When we look at this here, let's talk about MTG stocks. Uh, Brody has a link in the description. This stream is brought to you by the fine folks over at MTG stocks. Brody's MTG premium affiliate link here. Brody running up the stock charts. Here this morning with the folks, oh Arjun and the boys from the uh, news group and the article writing group over at the stock desk. If you want to pick up yourself a copy of the, uh, if you want to get yourself a subscription of the premium membership for MTG stocks, you can use my affiliate link and get fifteen percent off. Now you say, what do you get? What do you get for a dollar, Brody? What do you get for the premium membership? Well, let's take a look. We get some awesome features 
here let's take uh let's take a look let's sign up sign in get that moving for so you guys can preview this let's see here signing in oh yeah something always goes wrong Hit it up. Signing in. Let's try it one more time. Brody can't function this morning. Brody can't click. All right, let's go to our premium account here. Premium. So what do we get in the premium? We get all these extra functions, and we've been creating a watch list to try and track the prices of Magic cards, and we've got some speculations for you folks here on our watch list. Now we can also... So we got tra price trends, price alerts, minute movers. Let's see what's some price alerts. The price alerts is a function that you can add an alert. Let's see minute movers. Uh, you got to create some rules for this. I haven't done it yet. Uh, let's go card inventory interest. Card kingdom interest. Penny stock and underpriced cards. Okay, so all these prices here are posted by Card Kingdom and thus can differ from their prices on the card pages themselves. So there's some interest. All right, so regular price, foil, and the buy list. Let's take a look at these interests. These are, myself, I want to go straight to the buy list because these are like some cards that... Uh, these are some cards that you might have already in your collection, and you can use them to get some, some extra store credit out of them. Zurin Or foil buy list. What is what what is hot on the buy list here right now? Uh, I'm gonna move this to like the big money. Secret Layer Islands, Universes Beyond Steel Overseer. Still not very uh, expensive. Where's the penny stock? Let's go to the penny stock. Okay, so the penny stocks function is a premium function, and for the cards that you can uh, identify that are below five dollars that seem to have continuous upward trend for at least a month. These cards are still fairly cheap and may be interesting cards to pick up or hold for longer term. Cards that have recently spiked in price are not included in this list since it would give a skewed trend amount. So penny stocks, these are cards that uh, have been trending. You got Dark Ritual from the U Universe is Beyond Warhammer 40k. Fist of Sun. This is an interesting card. You can pay a Wooberg rather than pay the mana value for spells you cast. This card could be quite interesting and have some legs. Creature of Schism, Darkness. Here's another card that actually is a speculation. Let's take a look at this card. All right. There's other versions of this card. And now, which one would I be buying? The Legend. This one's 10 bucks. I love the art on this card. This is the original Legends version. It's 10 bucks. It's been up as high as 30. This is a card that is this, another penny stock, a fairly cheap pickup, identified here by the premium stock, uh, MTG stocks premium. And then where's this underpriced card? Cards that have a higher market price than the average price that could indicate the card has a low supply and is being listed by sellers for too low of price since they don't realize how much this card is currently worth. These cards may be a viable opportunities to get for cheap. I'm just going to shrink, shrink Brody down a little bit here this morning. So you can see the whole list. Shrinking. I'm going to eat the small mushroom and become a little bit smaller. All right. Let's see. Difference. This is giving us an idea of price disparity. And if you want to take a look at this list here for a moment, Unlimited Edition Will of the Wisp, Rake from Arabian Nights. There's a difference in 328% from... Uh, from the sellers versus the the buyers who are buying this card. So, Rock Egg, Fungasaur from Unlimited, Raised Dead from Alpha, funny card. Green War, some of these old Alpha cards, including the Fireball, is 124% difference. So, like, average price for selling this card is $111, but the market price for, for uh, the average price for to, 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 of this card is $111, but, like, the vendors will be selling it for $249. So if you look at like the comparison of where you can pick this card up, it's actually a lot cheaper than what the vendors themselves are selling it for. Decent card. I'm looking for like fiery mashed potatoes. Interesting card. Here's a card that I vendor. So like this card is selling. Where are we here? This card's selling for $20.56 at the vendors. And like you can pick it up on the open market for $9.40. A decent card that like I think it doubles. 
triple the amount of damage that can be done here. Wooly Wolf, shout out to my cousin Jimmy if you're in the house. Check this card out. We got Black Word, all these Word cards, some of these Alpha Beta and Unlimited collectibles. These aren't like super playable cards, but you can see from what the the market disparity is, like you can actually pick them up for about half of what they're listed at the vendor shops. Wrath of God from Unlimited Edition, you can pick it up for about $134, but it's selling over the vendors for 265 Shinode and Dryads, not a card that a lot of people are playing, but this is common from Alpha card. Maybe if some people are trying to finish up some Alpha sets right now, this might be a time to do it while there's some price disparity in the market. Blue Elemental Blast, another card like this is definitely still playable to this day, despite the rounded corners. Red Elemental Blast, Blue Elemental Blast, you know, it's uh, selling at the vendor shop for 71 bucks, but you can find it on the open market for 41. Vesuv and Doppelganger, Ring of, uh, Ring of Mayor Ruff. There's a bunch of reserve list cards, and all the cards with a star next to them are reserve list. So let's head on over to our watch list. Any cards? Dun, 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 something. We're having a little bit of a function problem. We got any new articles here this morning? Ah, Jason Caminetto. All right, we got time for one more article for you folks. This is a new one, published yesterday, but it just came out this morning. We've been on stream for a couple of hours, and this one wasn't here when we first started, so let's bring it to you with near and dear. From Jason Caminetto from the MTG Stocks Desk, let's, let's eat another mushroom and make Brody just a little bit larger and in charge here today. All right, the best cards of the new crime mechanic. Let's discuss it here this morning with you folks here joining us on the morning show where we discuss the prices of magic cards, news, articles. We're taking a look at the watch list, the buy list, the movers and the shakers, and a whole lot more. All right, cowboys and cowgirls, cow folks, and those who like to function at the Outlaws of Thunder Junction. So you think you want to be an outlaw, do you? Don't let me get in the way. But there's a few things that you should know before diving and driving into a lifetime of crime. Crime, of course, being a devious new mechanic from the Outlaws of Thunder Junction, which is defined as whether you cast a spell or activate an ability that targets an opponent or their stuff. There's a plethora of ways to take advantage of this, and however, it seems that there's primarily one once per turn at the time of this writing. So if you still want to get your hands dirty, here are some cards that might help you on your path to lawlessness. Who knows? You may just utilize some of these, and maybe one day your wanted poster could be hung next to Oko's. Freed from the Real and Penman's Aura. Oh, okay. I like where we're going with this, Jason Cominetto. One of the easiest, most straightforward ways to interact with your opponent and commit a crime is through the use of pingers. They're very simply, every time you tap them, they trigger, and then they may even help you take out some of the pesky hate bearers or other small bodies along the way there. Only problem is that they each can only be activated once per turn. And while some cards like Jelectrode and Goblin Sharpshooter can untap simultaneously, there's a handful of cards that you can use to ensure you're getting one ping in each turn during a standard four-player game of Commander. Feed from the Real. All right. Feed from the Real. Penman's Aura is another great card. This card was played... Uh, in many ways in Commander to go infinite. It's an enchantment that costs you two blue and one, and you pay a blue to untap target enchanted creature, and you can play a blue to give it flying, you can play a blue to give it... Uh, can't be the target of spells or effects or hexproof, and then you can pay one color to give it plus one, minus one, or minus one, plus one. Feed from the Reel is similar, but it only does the tap or untap abilities. The mana cost is similar, but it's one blue and two, so it's a little easier to play. So feed from the real and Penguin's aura combined with cards that tap to do a damage that gets you committing a crime. Feed from the real and Penguin's aura are solid choices because both of which equate to basically pay one blue mana and commit a crime. When attached to a pinger, they're not they're just under four dollars and six dollars respectively at the moment, and with the latter of its lowest in most almost four years. Penguin aura was a house of a card that was played in Commander and comboed out with a couple of cards in the past and you saw an all-time price high of about 20 bucks Pemmon's aura is even as added bonus of giving your creature shroud at instant speed and if need be since it's the only been printed in scourge and the list it might be a good idea to pick up sooner than later if you're thinking of giving this particular approach a try if you're thinking of committing crimes bye, bye, bye. 
The Pembenzor and the Fee from the Rear are two specs here brought to us by Jason Cominetto. For a cheap price, you can add these to your deck. And the Seaboard Muse. This card, I mean, I don't understand how Prophet of Crufix is legal. It's not legal in Commander, but the Seaboard Muse is. This is an interesting card. And I like Unwinding Clock as well because it gives you an untap of all your artifacts during each of your opponent turns. The Drum Bellower is a flying spirit for one weight and two. And it's a 2-1 that says untap all creatures you control during each other player's untapped step. Mainly busted. The Senior Muse untaps all your permanents during each other player's untapped step. And maybe you don't want to use your resources each turn to get this result. So crime is supposed to pay after all. Who says crime doesn't pay? Not the other way around. Here are two incredible options that you can use to untap your pingers on each of your opponent's turns. If you want to be committing some crimes, the first and most obvious choice is the Seedborn Muse at an all-time classic that's more than earned the minimum $10 price tag despite many printings. And that being said, Seedborn Muse is so ubiquitously good that I don't believe the introduction of a crime mechanic will affect its price as much as the drum bellower, whose time of is in the sun is long overdue trail laying behind at five bucks this creature from commander kamigawa neon dynasty can achieve the same effect of a crime wise seed born moose for just three mana and i'll be at the risk of dying from a single ping itself on while there aren't traditional colors for pingers per se there are other types of creatures that can target in different ways in a multicolored deck they're more than get the job done the bottom line is you want these two as your partners in crime Glare of Subduel and Delusionary Tactics. Now, Glare of Subduel, holy smokes. You want to talk about a world championship card? The Glare of Subduel is such an underrated card, and it actually won uh, the world championships of Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering World Championship. All right, if you didn't know it, uh, Magic the Gathering World Championship. Let's find it. Control F, Glare. All right, Gazi Glare deck. This card has been around for uh, some time, uh, 2005. So 19 years, the Glare of Subduel has been around. And Katsumor Katsuhiro Mori won the World Championships of Magic the Gathering in 2005 with his Gl Gazi Glare deck. So the Glare of Subduel was in this deck because it was so powerful and it could be used to combine in a Selesnya build to just overwhelm your opponents and win the game now let's just take a look at the glare it says tap an untapped creature you control tap target artifact or creature paired with the last two cards or perhaps even without them if you got the bodies of these three enchantments you can also help guarantee that your crime is going to trigger every turn by simply tapping two creatures or one in the case of opposition you can target one of your opponent's permanents without paying any mana cost whatsoever letting, letting you save your precious resources for counter spells or other responses in case of emergency. So the Gazi Glare deck of the Glare of Subduel was a way to like tap your untapped creatures to like tap down your opponent's blockers and deal some straight up damage to the face during combat. The Glare of Subduel has been around for a long time, even since it won the World Championships of Magic the Gathering in 2005, and now it could be a chance to pick it up. It's seen a couple of printings. Glare of Subduel does the trick, and opposition is clearly the most utility out of the Three, but my sleeper pick would have to be for divisionary tactics, particularly the foiler treatment. Light play versions can be fine at the time of writing this for around three bucks, which I think is a steal of a deal. And the old border foils look breathtaking in person, as this coupled with the fact that the card is highly splashable and has only been printed in Apocalypse makes for a solid pickup. Solteri Gorillas. Oh, goody. We've got some Tempest cards. Solteri Gorillas commits crimes in their sleep. Once this card hits the field, if you're so much as glare in its direction, it will pull a fast one on you. What does it do? It's a Boros card. For one red, one white, and two, you get a 3-2 with Shadow of Sword. Tari Gorillas assigns combat damage to a player. You may redirect that damage to target creature. This thing commits crimes. It can block or be blocked only with creatures with Shadow, so it's quite sneaky. And it can do, uh, they do the trick if you're looking to commit some crimes. It's sneaky too. One would think that by looking at the rules text on it, on it for a quick second on the surface level that it doesn't have any activated ability, but in reality, the opposite is true. Take a look at the wording on the actual card compared to the updated Oracle text. If Solitary Gorillas assigns combat damage to 
any opponent, you may redirect the damage to target creature. So that commits a crime right there. If Gorillas assigns combat damage, you get to re re redirect it rather than pay zero the next time that it would deal combat damage to an opponent this turn, it deals that damage to target creature instead. Upon initial reading of the card as it exists, it seems like you have to deal combat damage to a player to activate Solteri Gorilla's ability, but you can actually activate it at will. This is the only card that allows you to commit crimes. In this case, by targeting one of your opponent's creatures to do to no effect for zero resources, arbitrarily at instant speed as many times as you want. The only other card that comes close to this is Eater of the Dead, which has this activated ability of zero. Take a creature from any graveyard and remove it from the game, untap Eater of the Dead. So you can activate this over and over and over again. I want to take a look at the Gatherer text after this, which is arguably harder to set up uh, and is over 20 times the price, albeit more splashable and still incredibly powerful. The only requirement for Sertari Gorillas is that there's one creature on the field between all of your opponents, which is, a, which is bound to happen in the Commander game. And even if not, you can use something like Forbidden Orchard which itself has had a, held a steady price tag around eight bucks, its cheapest price in over four years, to set yourself up and give your opponent of creatures that you can use to commit a crime on. So Terry Gorillas is quite, isn't quite versatile, being both red and white, but for the decks that are in those colors and want to commit crimes, and consider, consider this a snap pickup like Drum Bellower and Divisionary Taxes. This card has only got one printing and it's currently sitting at around a half a dollar, which is a small price to pay for a card that can not only provide you crime triggers each and every time, like the other recommendation, but can also do it as many as times as you want for free. In conclusion, I do slightly worry about more intricate interactions of committing crimes being overly convoluted, and for some, Newer players, how many times have you forgot to target on cast? I think this direction makes the game an exciting direction and moving. And it, if you see for yourself, you're wanting to try it out, you could do worse than check out these picks. Thanks, Jason Cominetto. I'm going to check out, I'm going to have to connect with Jason over on X for sure. Longtime lover of Magic, falling in love with the game from 7th edition on, as well as EDH and Enthusiast. Both casual and competitive metas alike. He's also a screenwriter with a produced feature and plans to proceed with many more creative products in and out of the game. His favorite card is Rofales, Lana War Emissary, but he believes that Mana Drain is the best card. Awesome. So let's take a look at the Soltari go Gorillas because I want to look Soltari Gorillas. Soltari Gorillas. Let's take a look at the, yes. So the original wording on this card is, you know, if you look at the wording of the card, if it assigns combat damage to any opponent, you may redirect that damage to target creature. So this says, it's been errated to have zero. The next time Solteri da uh, Gorillas would deal combat damage to a player or, or to an opponent this turn, it deals that much, that damage to target creature instead. So for zero, you can proc this and commit as many crimes as you want. You can use it to, uh, this card doesn't even move. This is a bot. What is this from Tempest set? There's no foil versions of it. It's been in Tempest remastered once online, but there's only a single printing of it. Watch this card move. Once this article has only been out for a couple of hours, this card's only worth a dollar and a half. There's still some of it available at the vendor store. If you go there now, you can pick this up for 50 cents and get it into your collection. Also available on eBay. So if you're interested in committing some crimes, it's got some Mal Mayer art on it this thing for zero commit a crime free crime who says crime doesn't pay nice nice and the spice is twice as nice all right folks thanks again uh, thanks a million and a bazillion and a brazilian for all of you folks tuning in with me for the long stream here this morning i want to say thanks again for joining me on your Magic the Gathering finance adventure. It's been a heck of a Thursday. I'm thirsty. I need another cup of coffee. I want to thank you folks for joining me. It's been a it's been a heck of a Thursday. A good one. Probably the best stream ever. From herding cattle to riding on the open range, the Western lifestyle is something that many people envy. These Western Thunder Junction cards and new mechanics can make 
your Magic the Gathering experience a little bit more fun. But you want to find the hidden gems, the cards that are undervalued, like the Solteri Gorillas and others, like the uh, the Tutor card that gets you mercenaries. Tune in here where we discuss the prices of Magic cards. And if you wear cowboy clothes and cowboy hats, does that mean you're ranch dressing? Hard to say. But the cowboy that has an argument with his cows afterwards, you tell them to turn down the utter cheek and move on. Appreciate you. Let's get the let's get moving and grooving here this morning. You're gonna have a good fine early afternoon. Where have you got me? Let's go to a little bit of Ron Burgundy with a little bit of jazz flute for the outro. Ha! I think that's how it goes. 